Behind the Iron Curtain, a small group of men controls the lives of some hundred million human beings. From behind the Iron Curtain, the same small group threatens the peace and liberty of humanity. Why are they so? What is this communism which drives them on? This is the Catholic Hour. The Catholic Hour is produced by the National Council of Catholic Men in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations. Today, the Catholic Hour presents the last in a series of four programs on communism entitled Communist Society. To tell the story of the communistic philosophy of life, here is the Reverend James J. McQuaid of the Society of Jesus and head of the religion department of John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio. If you ever get a chance to take a course in geology, by all means do so. You'll find it a most interesting subject. It studies the nature of the Earth and how it came to be what it is. The story is all there in a record of a series of layers of stone. Some of them are sandstone that has been made by the wind and the wave beating against the rocks of the Earth. Some of them are limestone layers. And those are made by Billions and billions of little shellfish who lived and died and left their shells behind them. Now, it took a long time of wind and wave and shellfish to build up some 30 miles of the stuff. This 30 miles of stuff is just like a many-layered cake. <coughs> and in each layer, we find the remains of the various things that were on the earth when the layer was baked. In the top layer and on the surface, we find all the things that are in existence today. Plants, fish, and birds, reptiles, animals, and men. It took about 52 million years to lay down this layer. But if you go under that to the one that's called the Mesozoic, which was laid about, oh, 152 million years ago, uh, we find plants and fish and birds and reptiles, but nothing else. And if you go down below that, you find a very thick layer. It's called the Paleozoic layer. Uh, that began to be laid down 574 million years ago. And there you find fish and birds and plants and elements, but no more reptiles. And down below here in the Proterozoic era, which began to be laid, it's almost impossible to imagine it, 1900 million years ago, uh, we find plants and elements and nothing else. And below that, down in the Ozoic or non-life period, we find igneous rocks, and that is all. Geology gives us the fact that every several hundred million years or so, a new form of life appeared on the Earth. The question is, how did that come to be? What made it happen like that? Well, there are three great answers to that question. The most simple answer is, well, that's the way God created them. And you know, it is an interesting fact that Moses, when he wrote these first words of the Bible, got these things appearing on the earth in exactly the same order in which geology, which was only recently invented, has found them in the actual rocks of the earth. So that if somebody says, either Moses was inspired or he was a very good geologist. That theory is called the theory of special intervention, that God intervened in his creation from time to time and came up with something new. 
The second answer is that which Charles Darwin <coughs> began to play around with. It's called the theory of uh, biological evolution. Uh, according to this theory, these various forms of life developed from one another by reason of the interior forces adapting themselves to new circumstances as they change from time to time. Uh, well, on the bottom of the ocean floor, the little plant wiggled and waggled and wiggled and waggled until suddenly one wiggled free and began to swim and you had fish. And then the fish discovered the surface. And he flipped and he flopped out of the water and into the water. Until one day, he flipped, <laughs> but he didn't flop. And so you had the bird flying through the air. And then the bird somehow or other fooled around with the water, and the fish fooled around with the land, until somehow or other they adapted a cross, and you had the reptiles on land and sea. Finally, one of the reptiles wandered off into the woods and kind of got cold and grew fur, and you had the animals. It sounds silly the way I put it, but it really isn't. In the first place, I have caricatured the uh, theory. <coughs> it's much more scientific than that. In the second place, there's no reason why God could not have created originally some original form and then have everything else develop from that as circumstances change. It's still just a theory. The scientists are working on it. We hope that they establish it one way or the other. But the third answer is the one we're interested in. The answer of the communist. Upon his answer, he is building the whole future of the race, and he is constructing the whole social order of humanity. The communist is the only one of the three who rules God completely out of the picture. He starts out with the idea that this material universe is all there is, there was, there ever will be. But it's getting better. In his theory, it's getting better by what he calls the law of conflict or struggle. According to this law, there's lots of struggle and struggle and struggle, and all of a sudden, there's a leap to a new form of life or a new form of existence. In his idea, in the beginning, there were stresses, strains, and tensions in the order of the material universe. There were explosions and conflicts, and these got worse and worse until suddenly there was some sort of a leap in nature and little plants began to grow here and there about the earth. The plant world in its turn was filled with stresses, strains, and tensions. Millions of years went by until these stresses, strains, and tensions reached the breaking point. There was a leap in nature, and fish began for the first time to swim and the birds to fly. And now there was more tension. Birds against birds, fish against fish, elements with elements. And that went on until there was another leap in nature, and the dinosaurs began to flounder around, and the snakes began to slither on the earth. It was the age of the reptiles. Then, of course, <coughs> we did have more and more stresses brought into the world. And these stresses stress, and these strains strain, and these tenses tense until there was a lot of breaking all about, a new leap of nature, and furry mammals began to wander in the jungle. Now, the greater the leap in nature, the greater the stresses, strains, and tensions. <coughs> it was a great leap from the reptile to the animal, but nothing at all like the leap that had to be made uh, in the next step of the process. Now we did have a stressful, strainful, tense-filled world. And all these grew and grew and grew until we had the next leap in nature, the leap to individual man. 
individual man with the nature that we know him to have today, the individualist who has his own personal ideals and his own personal characteristics. And all that this man did was increase the tension. <coughs> individual man, the man who looks out for himself and his own is inevitably, so says the communist, in conflict with other individualistic men uh, who look out for themselves and their own. In fact, he says, the, the history of the human race is nothing but the story of the growing clash between individualistic man and individualistic man. First of all, there was the clash of slavery, which yielded to the greater clash of feudalism and the still greater class of capitalism. And this goes on and on, corporation against corporation, nation against nation, the uh, proletariat against the capital, until a great day will come when these stresses, strains, and tensions will be so great that they will give birth to the new leap in nature and to collective man. Now, this collective man is going to be different altogether different in nature from ourselves. He will have an altogether different mentality, and therefore the society in which he lives will be an altogether different sort of thing than we are accustomed to live in. This new society will look not to the individual, but to the whole collectivity. The individual won't count. He won't be important. As a matter of fact, the individual himself will look not at all for his own good, but only for the good of others. In fact, his personality will be so fused with that of all the others that he will think the same, work the same, live the same, have the same as all others. Uh, just as a lake trout will not leave its school of fish and walk down the beach on its tail. So neither will collective man wish to leave the lockstep life of the collectivity. It just will be against his very nature to do so. <laughs> no, this collective man will be utterly happy in the thought that the collectivity is the all. The individual is not important. He will have no trouble, as we would, in suppressing our personal tastes and private wishes. By reason of this leap in nature, he won't even have any personal tastes and private wishes. All he will even have is the common wishes of humanity and the common tastes of the collectivity. And so society will not exist for the individual. That is the way things are now in this uh, very imperfectly developed stage of materialistic evolution. No, uh, society, uh, he will exist wholly and entirely for society. He will be secondary to everything and every consideration in society. And that will be the eternal place of the individual in communist, communistic society. But what about the family in this new order? Oh, that's going to be altogether different, too. Individual man, as we know him, has come to look upon the family as his own. He speaks of my wife, my children. The individualistic child speaks of my mother, my father, my brother, my sister. Now, in the mind of the communist, the only reason for that is that we live in a society that is dominated by the dollar sign. The father holds the means of livelihood, and therefore, the wife must sell her exclusive services to the pocketbook of her husband, and the children to are under the debasing necessity of rendering obedience for support. 
Ah, but when the next new leap to collective man takes place, then we shall have something altogether different. Human nature will change from being self-centered to being social-centered. And now, no man will even seek the exclusive companionship of any woman. Nor will any woman ever seek the exclusive companionship of any particular man. Both will be free of the economic necessity of living together under contract. The contract of marriage goes. Oh, children will be born. Yes. But mothers will be different. Instead of bearing children for themselves as they do now, they will bear children for the community. And the community will take those children and educate them and train them for the collectivity. So goes the family. And as the family, so the state will pass away. When we look at the state, we see a many-sided thing. To us, the function of the state is in all various fields of human living. But to the communist, the one sole function of the state is to regulate the economy, to restrain the individual, from seeking his advantage to the disadvantage of his fellow men. In our present society, the function of the state is to enforce justice, the, the, the principle of to each his own. That is because in this present order, the individualist tends to steal that which belongs to others. In this present order, the sole function of the state is to restrain the individual from creating scarcities through which he hopes to exploit his fellow men. Now, in this order, the communist readily agrees, the state is necessary. Ah, but when the change to the collective man takes place, the whole picture will be different. Now you will have a human being whose sole passion and sole urge is to uh, do the good for his fellow man, not for himself at all. And, and therefore, since this is going to be a change in nature, it'll be true all over the world, every place. And so, there will be no need to restrain the individualist from exploitation. There will be no individualist to do the exploiting in the same way, there will be no need to prevent people from stealing. There will be no reason to steal. Everyone will have all he wishes. There will be no individualists around to create scarcities. And therefore, in the communist ultimate ideal, there isn't going to be any democratic government, nor even any communist government. There isn't going to be any government at all. We're all going to live together, loving each other and doing for all and all for one. <laughs> what a glorious mirage uh, that is. So, family goes, the state goes. All this, uh, this new skyline of the future is going to be a whole lot different from the skyline of today. Today we have the domes and towers of our city halls and courthouses. All of these will pass away. But above all, these steeples in our big cities and in all the little villages throughout the length and breadth of our land will pass away. For as the family so, and the state, so religion will leave the world. We look at religion, again we see a many-sided thing, and a lovely thing for many fields of human life and action. We look at the great religions of the world. We look at the Hindu religion, and we see the root and source of the great culture of India. We look at the Jewish religion, 
and we see the tradition of centuries of loyalty to a great ideal. We look at the Buddhist religion, and we see one of the grandest natural philosophies of living known to man. In the Christian religion, of course, we see the root and source of our whole civilization and culture. In the Mohammedan religion, the beauty of simple loyalty to a great ideal. And in the religion of Confucius, we see the history of one of the most respected civilizations in the world, the civilization of the great Chinese. But not the communist. To the communist, the one sole function of religion is to pacify the downtrodden victims of capitalistic oppression. To pacify them by offering them a future life where all will be well. Pie in the sky when you die, you know. By offering them a god, to give a god to an exploited man to help him bear in patience the pain of his exploitation. But after the new collective man emerges, there won't be any oppressed or downtrodden. There won't be any exploited to pacify because there will be no individualists left to do the exploiting. There won't be any need of suggesting a future heaven uh, because heaven is already here. And so religion will have died of uselessness. But, says the communist, until it does die of uselessness, it will continue to pacify. It will continue to offer the hope of some other life in the future that will lessen the stresses, strains, and tensions of modern society and so hold back the glorious day of that leap to the collective man. Now, it must not be allowed to do this. It must be destroyed in order to hasten this happy eventuality. Above all, it must not be allowed to be around to usher in the coming of this new collective man, to confuse him and make him worried about uh, uh, his new collective and self-sufficient society in which he is forming. And therefore, by his very basic principles, the communist is dedicated wholeheartedly to war with every single form of religion known to man. Oh, there's no mystery about communism. It's all down there in Joe Stalin's little book, Dialectical and Historical Materialism. He who runs may read. There is no enigma in communist policy. They tell you very plainly. It's all a matter of fostering this materialistic evolution. They are, they always have, they always will foster the stresses, drains, and tensions out of which will come the new collective man. And therefore, their policy is going to be what it always has been, to enter every single field and phase of human living in order to create the stresses, strains, and tensions out of which will come the new society in the political field, on the national and in the international level, party against party, nation against nation, east against the west, democracy against the satellite. The more stresses and strains and tensions, the sooner will come the leap to the collective order in economics. The motto is the same, struggle, struggle. Corporation against corporation. Union against union. Uh, company against union. Capitalist against proletariat. The sooner we get the stresses up to a breaking point, the better. The, the, the benevolent, the good capitalist, is the greatest enemy of, uh, of communism. The oppressive, selfish capitalist, if there be any left, is its greatest friend. The communists hold the motto, not reform, 
but revolution. Reform only uh, lessens the tensions and holds back the glorious leap to the future. In the same way in the field of religion. Uh, the Hindu must fight the Mohammedan. The Jew must fight the Arab. And all how the communist rejoices that individualist man has even broken down Christianity into warring sects and factions. The more of intolerance and bigotry, the better. Infiltrate the ministry, develop the tensions, stresses and strains, out of which will come the glorious golden era of collective man. And in the social field as well, race must be pitted against race. Class must be opposed to class. The more of irrational fears and hatred, the better. Do not these irrational fears and hatred beget stresses, strains, and tensions? And will not stresses, strains, and tensions hasten the leap to collective man? Why, even the mind of man itself is not to be spared this policy of disruption. Uh, infiltrate the universities. Error is multiple, truth is only one. Truth unites men, error divides them. Preach the doctrine of multiple philosophies so that the sooner we can get this individualistic brain of man to break, the sooner we will have the glory of collective man. In every field it's the same. And so, we have a divided world. On the one side, the hammer and the sickle. On the other side, the flags of the free nation. On the one side, a small group of men dedicated to forcing the whole of humanity into the molds of a preconceived and unproved evolution. And on the other side, some 800 million groaning under the red terror and the rest of humanity destined to be their victims. Our only hope of survival is to face these facts. Coexistence to a communist means nothing, and peace is impossible. Uh, you cannot coexist with one who is dedicated to your complete and utter destruction to make room for the collective man who will displace you. Today, the Catholic Hour has presented the Reverend James J. McQuaid of the Society of Jesus and head of the Religion Department at John Carroll University in the last of a series of four programs on the communist philosophy of life entitled Communist Society. If you would like to receive a copy of today's program, write to Catholic Hour TV, Washington 5, D.C. That's Catholic Hour TV, Washington 5, D.C. The Catholic Hour is produced by the National Council of Catholic Men. The Catholic Hour will return to the NBC TV network in April. At that time, the National Council of Catholic Men will present a special series of dramatic programs based on unusual stories of religious. This is Bill Hanrahan speaking.